ladies and gentlemen, before I have the owner to make the opening for the clothing, allow me to say thank you. Thank you, first and foremost, of course, to you for your anti-engagement over this summit. But of course, thank you to our very generous host state. Thank you to Mexico. And allow me to say also thank you to the many teams who have been engaged in the run-up for this meeting, during this meeting, and of course in the dismantling as well. Thank you to all the teams under the leadership of our regional director, Marisol Agueta. Thank you, Marisol. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, after hardworking days, we are coming out of this meeting full of hope in regard of Latin America's future. Of course, we know that this future depends on pushing forward Latin America's reform agenda. And this agenda rests on three pillars. First, strong institutions. Second, a sound economic strategy. And third, a well-engaged middle class. Strong institution means institutions that are transparent, agile, and credible. Institutions that are fighting against corruption as well as criminality, so that reliable governments can foster the trust of their citizens. Second, a sound economic strategy means an economic strategy beyond commodities, means investment into infrastructure for the mobility, trade, and tourism. And more and more important, investment into infrastructure of energy, and particularly digital infrastructure for connectivity and access. And third, we have to meet the middle class expectations. That means jobs, skills, training, education for the next generation for the youth. That means empowerment of the woman. And at the end, the message is very clear. Equal opportunities for all. Because, ladies and gentlemen, it is the middle class that shapes Latin America's future. And ladies and gentlemen, yesterday we've had the opening with a public sector, with three respected heads of state who shared their vision. And now I would like to turn to our private sector champions, to our co-chairs. Excellencies, we would like now to know what is your vision for Latin America? What is your takeaway from this regional summit? So thank you very much. And it's now my own pleasure to hand over to our today's moderator, Professor Andres Velasco. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Philip. Thanks again to our Mexican host. Thanks all of you for being here. We know you could be at the beach. You're not, you're here. We appreciate that. Congratulations. <laughs> Well, Philip tells us we should be optimistic, and we will try our best to be optimistic, but we also want to be analytical and uh, try to go beyond the surface of some of these issues and uh, get some new ideas, ideally, on the table. I was asked to provide a very brief summary of what I've heard, what the ethos is, what the concerns are, and what the hopes and expectations are at this meeting. And at the risk of uh, oversimplifying and, and following with a idea that you know, we, we should always go in threes. Let me put my three points on the table, which I'm going to call upon our panelists to uh, discuss, elaborate, and perhaps disagree on. First, in Latin America, we face a renewed growth challenge. Now that the commodities boom is over, now that the period of extraordinarily low interest rates in the rest of the world, in the rich world, is beginning to end, and last but not least, now that uh, it is not so fashionable as it used to be to invest in emerging markets. A few years ago, people were falling all over themselves, 
to bring money to the Mexico's, Brazil's, Peru's, Colombia's, Chile's of the world. Today, investors are looking elsewhere. So the question is, how do we grow? On the basis of what do we grow? What's the role for industrial policy? What's the role for renewed productivity? How we do, do we reignite productivity, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? That's, I think, the big economic challenge. Second of all, in spite of a decade or so of economic growth, Latin America remains a very unequal continent, a painfully unequal continent. And here we can see the glass half empty or half full. On the one hand, some countries, not all, have made some gains. We see Gini coefficients falling, different indicators of inequality beginning to budge after decades of immobility. But at the same time, we remain aware that uh, you know, inequality is still a big, painful fact present in our lives. And so the question is, what's the next stage in this battle? Some countries, for instance, have relied on cash transfers. Mexico was a leader, but not the only country. That's one policy tool. Maybe um, we want to look for other policy tools. There are issues of other inequalities, not simply the inequality of income. There are gender inequalities, regional inequalities, inequalities of access to opportunities, inequalities of political power. It is time to address those two. Last but not least, institutions. You know, there's, in any serious meeting, one has to utter the word institutions, so I've done it, institutions. The problem is, institutions in Latin America today are under challenge. If you look at polls and country after country, not only are governments losing uh, the popularity contest, but all kinds of institutions, including political parties, the Congress, in some places the judiciary, uh, private sector institutions like business associations or bankers, uh, traditional institutions like the armed forces, even more traditional institutions like the church, all of them face challenges of credibility, of legitimacy, their approval ratings are down. So, yes, institutions are important, but you know, a lot of Latin American citizens don't seem very happy with our institutions. What do we do about them? How do we go beyond the headline? and carry out sustainable political change, institutional change, in a way that makes these institutions more credible and also more effective at the time of uh, facing people's needs and tackling the region's challenges. So that's my contribution. I invite our stellar group of panelists to talk about these things. And uh, because I'm an economist, I am going to begin with the economy. Carlos Lim is here. Uh, a man who knows about productivity, who knows about uh, business, uh, entrepreneurship. What's next in this post-commodity boom, post-EM fashion boom? How do we grow? What do we make? To whom do we sell it? And what are the roles for innovation and technology in all of that? Thank you very Big much. topic, small time, two and a half minutes. Thank you very much, Andres. I would like as well to take the opportunity to thank again the World Economic Forum, particularly to Marisol for for inviting me to have the honor of co-chair this event. I think the, 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 it's very important that we understand that we are living a new era. You know? And a new era has new paradigms, has new opportunities, new risks, and particularly new challenges. We are in an era that is uh, transforming the way we traditionally do things. We are in an era where the biggest bookseller chain doesn't have stores, you know? in an era where the biggest uh, school doesn't have classrooms which is Khan Academy. And we're living in an era that is transforming the way we do the way things, the way we live, and particularly the way you, we should approach to the solutions. It's an era, as the others have been happening, that will, we uh, are, are very confident that will bring a lot of opportunities. And particularly, it's a, an era that is bringing access to everything. It's giving us access to entertainment. It's giving us access to more information. But it also is giving us access to have Better, uh, connecti better connection to better education, better health, and particularly doing it a very, in a very large, large scale. It's an era where the services are the biggest uh, growth on employment, on employment demand. And it's an era as well that for some of our countries coexists with the other three eras. We, in our societies, have the agricultural, the industrial, and this new technological uh, or access area. It's an era as well based on the ICT, on the information and communication platforms and infrastructure. And I think uh, the important 
uh, discussions around all the different topics that we share is how can we make this transition uh, faster, better, and more inclusive for, for the societies. It's an era that uh, in these main infrastructure uh, requirements, uh, needs, and demands a lot of investment. And at the end, as uh, Professor Stiglitz was saying in his opening remarks, it's an era that needs to boost employment so we can fight this inequality and keep building the middle classes in a much faster and much stronger ways. Thank you. You mentioned inequality. So in, these, in the opening round, let's move to that. And let me address this question to Angelica. Angelica, you've devoted uh, a good deal of your career to promoting women's rights and addressing gender issues. And in my mind, at least, and I suspect you're going to agree, uh, gender inequality cannot be separated from broader issues of inequality. In particular, if we look at poor households across Latin America, many of them, in some countries, a majority of them, are households headed by a woman who has very limited access to childcare. She has difficulties going out and getting a job because she has no place to leave her kids, very little access to training. That woman, if she gets a job, she's often discriminated at the workplace. How do we marry these two agendas? And how do we think about, for instance, employment promotion with good quality jobs for women as an inequality fighting agenda? Well, let me address this. First, it's known to everybody that will live in a region that's very unequal. I would like to state something that Professor Stiglitz said yesterday at the session of uh, From Poverty to Prosperity. He said, equality is a positive impact variable for economic growth, as you were saying. Um, I will, of course, address this inequality on, the, on a gender perspective. I would like to mention uh, some studies that have been done for the last 10 years, at least, by you know, uh, institutions like Goldman Sachs, Booz & Company, by the, you know, the IMF, where they state that if we bring the labor workforce to the same percentage mm -hmm. of women and men, today is 52 versus 80 men, if we bring women to that 80% mm -hmm. and equality with men in the labor force, understanding that in the beginning, at least a third of the women would work only part-time, which is about 60% of full-time. Understanding the productivity would come down because it would be the first time they would come into the labor force GDP in the region could increase up to 17%. So um, this is great for economic and social growth for the region. I, you know, I, I know that this is an all-inclusive conversation for both the private and the public sector. You know, it's good for men and women alike. It's not just good for women. It's good for societies. And uh, you know, we need public policy set in place. You know. We need better um, daycare. We need paternity leave as well as maternity leave, not just one and or the other. And we just need, you know, basically to reduce the barriers for this labor force to come, you know, in, into place. And then the private sector needs to implement those public policies. But then again, today we don't need laws for the public, uh, for the private sector to implement home office, flex time, infrastructure for uh, breastfeeding, and that is also good for men. It's not just good for women, so you know, we need family-oriented uh, frameworks within the corporations that we can put in place today without having to wait for any public uh, policy to change. You know, and we don't need to get lost in understanding that progress in equality, in gender equality, needs just three basic um, things to focus on. We need inclusion, development, and equal pay for equal work. Inclusion indicators where ratio of men to women in the participation, participa uh, participating in the workforce. We need development indicators where we can have a ratio of men to women on education and in performance. And of course, equal pay for equal work must be, you know, a, a, a rule that has to be set in place before all of this can happen. Thanks very much. And um, let, me, let me pose a precise follow-up question to Joe, because Joe is also somebody who's spoken very eloquently about inequality. But following up on, on, on Angelica's remark, if we're going to take seriously the fact that in most Latin American countries, say, only 40% of women of working age have a steady job, we have to think about issues like flex time, which you mentioned. That agenda is sometimes politically controversial, because more traditional segments of the left, for instance, think of flex time is potentially a threat to, say, job security. So 
In Latin America over the last few years, there has been a renewed emphasis on redistribution. That's a good thing. But the bulk of that emphasis is basically centered on tax and spend. And of course, the state is going to need more money. I myself uh, came out in Chile recently in favor of a tax reform, so you know, check on that. But then the more interesting question, or the more difficult uh, analytically and politically, is what do we spend that money on? How do we square the circle uh, of carrying out these policies that are effectively inclusive uh, in a way that requires changes in the labor market, for instance, that are not always um, politically easy to carry out? And what else is in that agenda that should be there and that we're not talking about, Joe? Okay, so first I want to emphasize uh, that we need to go beyond the redistribution agenda, beyond, you know, that's important, uh, but there's a real agenda here about the before tax and transfer incomes, the m distribution of market incomes. And in a way, what Angelica said really highlights that issue, uh, that m all of our societies have been marked by a lot of discrimination. Mm -hmm. And that means that some of the inequality is a result of the fact that we are discriminating in ways that both have exclusion, but also the wages are lower, the ratio of the wages. Mm -hmm. and it's not just women, gender, there's also ethnic, uh, uh, racial uh, discrimination. So that's a way in which we can get stronger economic growth at the same time that we get a more equal society. Particularly important in this period, following up on your first question, you know, we, we ex even if the countries reform, growth may be slower now that the commodity prices aren't, aren't, aren't as high. So the overall framework, I believe, is that you can address the issue of inequality and grow more fast, uh, more, more, more rapidly, that equality and growth economic performance are actually complements, particularly if you go beyond GDP as a measure of economic performance. I, I, I chaired uh, International Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress, and it was, our, our commission agreed unanimously that GDP was a bad measure. It didn't include aspects of quality of life, uh, family life. Uh, it didn't include aspects of inequality. So if you go beyond that narrow measure, especially, we can do better if we have more uh, uh, e equality uh, policies. But let me mention a couple of other things re relevant to uh, what's been going on, particularly here uh, in, in Latin America, but also elsewhere. Uh, one of the big reforms uh, here in, in uh, Mexico has been competition policy. And competition policy, we were talking before, actually has many aspects uh, it actually spurs economic growth, and it can increase, it, it lowers costs, and because of uh, real wages, standards of living are affected both by the nominal wage and by the prices. If you lower costs, it's like the same thing on electricity, you, you increase standards uh, of living. There's a second thing, though, um, which is things that we haven't been doing, uh, and still not on the agenda strongly, particularly here in Mexico, is raising the minimum wage. The minimum wage uh, is not at a livable wage. I, th I think it's like $5 an hour uh, here in Mexico. And raising that minimum wage raises wages all the way up the scale. Uh, I feel I can say this because in the United States, we also have a real problem. Our minimum wage is at the same level it was almost a half century ago. I mean, can you imagine? A, going a half century with no pay raise at the bottom. Meanwhile, the economy is continuing to grow. But I think it would also increase productivity uh, if you did that. And that has not yet been, uh, you know, we, United States, we haven't succeeded in doing that, and Mexico and many uh, of the other countries. The third thing is, I think it's really important for us not to make things worse. So what I'm trying to say is, there are a whole set of rules by which our society and our economy works that increase inequality and dampen economic growth. And uh, we ought to, we're doing some of the things, some of the things on the structural reform agenda like competition are right. There are some things that are not yet on the agenda. And what worries me, there are some things that are on the agenda that will make things worse. 
And uh, this morning I talked about TPP, the Trans-Pacific uh, Partnership. Uh, the United States is engaged on one across the Atlantic. I think that will be a set of rules that will increase uh, inequality. Finally, let me mention, uh, and it echoes back uh, what Carlos said about the importance of creating jobs. Because in a, in a sense, in the end, both growth and inequality are affected by uh, job creation. If you, if you have high unemployment, you're going to get high inequality. That's partly of, uh, what the business sector does, but it's also partly a lot with macroeconomic and monetary policy. Uh, if in this slowdown, particularly where the prices of commodities are down, you have contractionary policies, which will be a temptation in many countries that haven't created Chile's stabilization fund, uh, those contractionary policies will lead to lower growth, even lower and more inequality. And we've seen that vividly in Europe, uh, but I hope we won't see that in Latin America, but we, we know what will happen. The second thing is monetary policy. Uh, monetary policies around the world, I think, uh, were shown to be very flawed before the crisis. And what worries me is that when interest rates in the United States go up in response to improved conditions there, there'll be a tendency of those in Mexico and others to try to raise their interest rates without realizing that economic conditions are different. And that keeping those interest rates low would actually help spur growth and job creation uh, in Mexico and in other countries. Well, that's a lot of issues um, <laughs> on monetary policy. I have to say that one good thing that we have and the Europeans don't have is called a flexible exchange rate, right? Exactly. Um, uh, the caveat, of course, is that we have a lot of dollar debt. <laughs> Big depreciations in the presence of lots of dollar debt can be trouble. So we need to find uh, some kind of a middle point there. But one thing that I hear emerging here, uh, and let me mention it before I turn to Eduardo, is the notion that jobs are really a win-win proposition. Jobs are good for growth. If you bring people into the labor force, you want to produce more things. And jobs are also great for equality. Let me share one number with you. Among the richer households in the Republic of Chile, people at the top 10%, on average, there are 2.3 jobs per family. Father, mother, and one of the children is working, or at least one of the children is working part-time. If you go to households in the bottom 10% of the income distribution, on average, you have half a job per household. You've got to put two families together to get one steady job. So incomes are badly distributed, but access to jobs are also very badly distributed. And that's, that's got to be part of any growth agenda and also of any, Joe is right, redistribution, but even before that, pre-distribution agenda. That's a very useful distinction made by, made by a man called Hacker at Yale, a political scientist. We should be talking about pre-distribution along or sometimes before redistribution. Now, all of this, better child care, better labor market, better public transport, competition policy, calls for an effective state. And the state is nothing but the sum of the institutions in the state. So let's turn to Eduardo uh, to help us understand a little bit how do we meet not only the challenge of a state that is undergoing a legitimacy crisis, but also a state from which we're going to demand that they do a lot more things and better. Uh, all these things that we need for both the growth agenda and uh, the pre-distribution agenda. How do we square that circle, Eduardo? As if I had the solution for everyone, of course. right? <laughs> <laughs> and in under three minutes. <laughs> and two and a half, you said. Uh, so, well, I, I think uh, the, the starting point is uh, the institutions are losing uh, the shine and they're losing uh, the quality that they, have, that they should have. And this, I think, uh, should be looked at uh, from the angle of the leadership as opposed to the institution themselves. Uh, why do I say leadership? Because the global financial crisis and social media have accelerated our scrutiny of good leadership. And in the end, all the economic issues of, from innovation to uh, inclusion and so forth and so on depend on the right leaders and we've seen it in action. In some jurisdictions you see good leadership uh, taking the right management uh, attitudes and the right investments thinking long term as opposed to uh, their own uh, term uh, in, in office. 
The same goes, I think, uh, for private institutions. Uh, companies, and we work uh, all the time with them, uh, they do have to reinvent themselves because of the, with the crisis and because of the shortage and the commodities uh, uh, crisis that, that you raised uh, at the very beginning. They have to rethink themselves as to be more efficient, improve their governance, and that goes then to the ethics and uh, the work on a better governance, better compliance, which should derive in more trust from the consumers, from the people. So the, the, the point uh, that I would like uh, to raise is, in my view, it's about leadership, it's about the talents, it's about the human beings as opposed to the institutions. Uh, and it's about uh, the ethics, the way we govern ourselves. If we don't do something and do it very quickly at the pace we're going, and the accelerated uh, crisis and the accelerated social media, uh, the institutions are gonna suffer. And that is very hard to remediate, in my view. So leadership, let me pose a question to Carlos about business leadership, because if we look at these polls in which people are asked, you know, whom do you trust? A lot of Latin Americans don't trust political leaders or political parties or traditional political institutions. But in many countries and in many circumstances, they also express mistrust in business leaders and traditional business associations, as Joe Stiglitz, I'm sure, will remind us they don't trust bankers either. Um, <laughs> you know, um, we'll give, give a chance to say that at some point. Uh, um, uh, Carlos, what should business leaders be doing in Latin America to regain that trust? Joe mentioned, for instance, competition policy. Maybe they should be embracing competition policy. What other kinds of things should we, should we be expecting from business leaders so that they can also make a contribution to regain this mutual trust. So I think as well, the, is a characteristic of this era is that nobody can solve the problems by itself. So it's an era that is requiring much more collaboration and co-responsibility in the tasks that they need to be, to be addressed. I think, and, is, and I think it's part of the agenda that was discussed uh, within the forum, that uh, public-private partnerships should be stronger, but as well they should address not only economic issues, but as particularly social issues. And that this uh, collaboration or partnerships should be done uh, between sectors and between regions as well. Uh, we have seen, as is happening with the Pacific Alliance, how uh, getting more collaboration and more integration makes regions stronger, makes them develop better, makes job creation uh, have a better, a better opportunity. So I, I will say that we need to do more collaboration regarding more, pro, more programs and more problems beyond the only economical ones. Angelica, what about the role of NGOs? Um, you've been involved in civil society, also in business. Uh, NGOs are not a substitute for the state, but maybe they're a complement to the state. Um, we want to strengthen civil society, you know, like institutions, one has to say that to feel good about oneself, but uh, if uh, one looks at Latin America vis-a-vis -vis other regions of the world, I think it is fair to say that historically, maybe not so much anymore, civil society was weaker. But we see a civil society that is becoming empowered, maybe because of technological change, maybe because of a more educated middle class, who knows. Both to Eduardo and to Angelica, how do we see this evolving and what else can we do? What other levers can we pull to make this a faster process? You know, NGOs definitely are key players nowadays to make things happen as well as the private sector and the private, uh, public sector. But I believe that in our region, sometimes we, well, in the past we perceived um, this kind of philanthropy as charity, which does not work. Charity, we found out, does not work. So we need to move into NGOs who do more of what Matthew Bishop said, philanthropic capitalism, where, for example, my foundation and, and other foundations, what they do is not just give them something to just cover whatever the problem they have, but they train people. I think training is extremely important in a region. I also think that NGOs need to uh, be more geared into programs that can help them that can help them start but just push them out there so they can have that financial independence that they're working that can be job creators as well. So I think we just need to change that vision on, on philanthropy, on, on really pushing, you know, all those people along into 
their own independence. I think uh, that when you give people without them having worked for it, they in turn turn back and uh, are not very appreciative and they can turn onto you. But if you give them the tools and you give them the know-how and you train them for whatever it is that they want to achieve in their life, then those people can you know, participate in a more positive light. And then you, know, you can also gear them towards being you know, uh, participants of formal economies. And, and, and that can happen because I've seen it firsthand with what we do, especially you know, with women, which is who I work with. Eduardo, we're making bigger demands on governments and traditional institutions to be transparent. We should be doing the same thing vis-a-vis -vis civil society, right? I fully agree, uh, absolutely. NGOs, uh, private sector, they have a, an increasing important role in being transparent, showing integrity, and that's where we may be able to rebuild the trust, uh, showing that uh, one is taking measures to consolidate uh, the democratic institutions by investing in the rule of law, its enforcement, and uh, in inclusive and uh, very serious internal compliance programs. I, th I think uh, that's the way we will only be able to restore <laughs> trust and uh, people's confidence in leadership and in the institutions. Thanks very much. We're going to open it up to questions from the audience in one second. But before I do that, I, I want to pick one bone with my friend Joe Stiglitz here. TPP Joe. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there are two kinds of criticisms one can voice against the PPP, the TPP, sorry, and I share one, and I don't think I share the other one. Let me explain what it is that I'm talking about. Unlike businesses in Thailand, where they can easily sort of become part of the Chinese-based value chain, you know, you make a part for the iPhone, it gets assembled in China, sold worldwide, or unlike businesses in, say, Central Europe, where the same thing can be done uh, for goods assembled in Germany, Latin companies and Latin American economies, with the big exception of Mexico, which is plugged into North America, we are not plugged in into any value chains. And of course, this makes something that you and I would like, industrialization, uh, difficult. You can't just make a component, you've got to make the whole thing and then market it in some faraway country. This seems to me a very strong case for further trade integration along the lines of the TPP. It makes, easier, it makes it easier for a company in Santiago or in Lima or in, or in Medellin to plug into those value chains. And, you know, uh, it is going to be the Pacific century, so we want to be making friends in that, in that part of the world. On the other hand, there's the uh, intellectual property issue, which you've written about, I just wrote a piece about. There are demands being made by the United States which are hard to square with both uh, economics you know, there's no economic law that says that patents should be as long as possible, and which also could have bad effects on income distribution, uh, bad effects on innovation. How do we think about all of this? Um, uh, and on balance, given that we have these two tensions, are you for or against uh, the Trans-Pacific Trade pan Partnership? Uh, well, uh, maybe I'll begin with the bottom line. I'm very much against it. Okay. And uh, it's not that I'm against trade. I mean, the fact is that tariffs are already pretty low. Mm -hmm. They could get lower, but this agreement is mostly not about trade. Uh, it's not only about the intellectual property provisions, which will make access to health care, uh, access to knowledge more difficult. The knowledge gap is one of the most important gaps between develop and developing countries, and it's going to make it harder to close that gap. But uh, it's mostly about drugs, and uh, it's being driven by our pharmaceutical industries. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I say the pharmaceutical, it's big pharma. It's not the generics who are trying to provide low-cost drugs and have been strongly against the agreement. So it's only a small fraction of our big drug com of our drug companies that are pushing this agreement. But the worst part is the in uh, invest what's called the investor agreement. Uh, it's about, uh, it has a whole set of provisions, most of which are m designed to make it more difficult to have regulations about health, uh, uh, safety, worker conditions, uh, environment, even uh, financial sector. 
you know, like the regulations uh, that Chile signed on about uh, capital market capital controls, liberal capital controls that, that became a problem when QE occurred and the, there was an onslaught of capital and, and most countries like Brazil who didn't have these agreements started doing things. Brazil, uh, Chile was much, was in a difficult position to, to respond. Uh, what is interesting is there is no evidence that these provisions lead to faster growth, more investment. Uh, and the largest country in this region, Brazil, has been very explicit about not signing an agreement where the investor state dispute resolution where a private firm can sue uh, uh, in private arbitration panels a government. They have said they will never sign such an agreement. So, and, and South Africa had such agreements, and they've canceled them, they've announced it because they wanted to have a regulation for affirmative action to respond to the decades of apartheid, and they got sued for those regulations that were trying to create equality. So a country that wants to have gender neutrality, you know, gender equality, they can be sued if you pass a law saying you have to have equal pay because you can be sued for uh, uh, recovery of the expected profits that you would have gotten from the exercise of discrimination. Can you believe that? And these are not only potential suits, I say in South Africa, and I mentioned this morning the case of Uruguay, where Uruguay is being sued by a cigarette company for regulations that are just about packaging, saying, uh, the package, cigarette package, uh, is labeled dangerous for your health. And then, like in Mexico, they actually show it by what's happened to your blackened lungs. And guess what? When people see that, they don't buy as many cigarettes. And it's working. But the cigarette companies say, you're taking away our profits. And you have to compensate us for not killing your citizens. These litigation is extraordinarily expensive. Mayor Bloomberg is paying Uruguay's cost because they can't afford it. Bloomberg is committed to having health in New York, but the U.S. government is committed to making sure that Uruguay people are exposed to cigarettes that will kill them. And to me, I think that's uh, unacceptable. Uh, so these are basic principles around which you organize a society. Um, and one of the really, you know, heartwarming thing is after the morning session where I raised this, they described this as the new opium war, you know, back in the 19th century, uh, uh, China, uh, the way the trade imbalance, you know, exports exceeded imports was corrected. China had lots of things the West wanted, the West didn't have anything that China wanted, there was a big trade surplus. And uh, Europe figured out a great way to correct that, export opium. And it has, a, you know, a, 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 I teach in the business school, one of the products that uh, all of you know, the best kind of product is one with repeat purchases, uh, customer loyalty. And opium is really good uh, in, in those terms. You know, once you take it, you stick with it. So, uh, China figured out it wasn't so good. Mm -hmm. And they stopped, they said, you can't export opium to us. And the West response was, this is a basic human right that we have to kill you and to sell opium. Mm -hmm. And they, not only a, a right, but they went to war. Twice they went to war, and it was where they got the concessions on the east coast of China. President Obama is now waging the 21st century opium war. <laughs> Uh, not opium, but of course cigarettes, cigarettes kill. We recognize that in the United States. Mexico recognizes that. And yet in TPP, there is a provision that will be an onslaught against the ability of governments to put regulations of this type against climate change as we discover a new, new, new hazard. We discover asbestos or some other new chemical it will not be possible to put regulations without paying the companies not to kill you. So you can understand why I may have some emotional 
uh, response. That I think this is not, if it were just about trade, I would support it. So for the record, I want to agree with Joe Stiglitz on one thing and disagree on another, and then we'll open it up. Agreement. Some of the demands that the U.S. Making, is making on intellectual property make no sense on the grounds you very well uh, uh, explained. Uh, agreement. It is crazy to do away with any ability of governments to control capital flows. Um, so yes, that should not be part of the TPP. On the other hand, I do not believe that any of these things are integral and inevitable parts of the TPP. That is US to say- US never signed an agreement without these provisions. That is not quite true. Chile has an agreement, for instance, a free trade agreement bilateral with the US in which we stood firm. We said we will retain the right to enforce capital controls and we did, and in fact, we've used them. And that's one of the things why, one of the reasons, for instance, why Chile has managed better through many of these crises. So you're right. The negotiating position of the US on many of these grounds is untenable. But I'm from Latin America, and I think we're going to negotiate hard, and we're going to come out at the end of the day with a better TPP. <laughs> See? So we're in Latin America, Joe. We're optimists. <laughs> now, we're going to open it up. The gentleman right here in the front row. Thank you for sharing such uh, insights, such insights with us this afternoon. My name is Jacques Bouic du Verger from New York. I'm a YGL. I have a couple questions, one for Professor Stiglitz and the second for Ms. Fuentes and Mr. Slim. So Professor Stiglitz, last time we saw each other was at the Council for Relations with New York, and you were talking about some of the findings <clears throat> from your research of OECDs with respect to upward mobility, and that was very surprising to many of us in that room, and I think it would be beneficial if you could share some of the key findings that are relevant to Latin America as you know, they look to move forward and increase the middle class, increase the economy. What are some of the things that you know, the region should avoid with respect to what you find in your founders? With respect to Mr. Slim and Ms. Fuentes, I think there's some low-hanging fruit that you know, should be picked, uh, not least of which is more inter-regional trade. Uh, that was brought up in a session yesterday. Um, if you look at Europe, it's something in the order of 69% of GDP is associated with interregional trade, whereas Latin America, it's in the mid to, to high teens. And so what role should large business play with respect to increasing that interregional trade, especially in lieu of the fact that regional governments don't have a lot of support, and if you were to wait for that to lead to more of that interregional trade, it could take a very long time, whereas private capital, private markets, private business could really move with more agency and uh, create a more responsible, more productive region. My family hails from Haiti, so definitely include sure. the Caribbean. Sure. Thank you. Why don't we take that beginning with Angelica when we'll make a round and then turn it back to you. I am mindful of the fact that in 15 minutes our Swiss hosts are going to be Swiss and tell us to end, so let's keep uh, interventions hopefully fairly brief and to the point. Angelica. You know, I think one of the most important things for um, uh, inter-regional trade would have to have would have to be to have um, similar uh, policy on, on different areas. It's one of the things that, for example, PPP has been working on uh, because sometimes you can bring in separate products into a different region, but then in, into another region you cannot because they have different. Um, what have you said? Different. Uh, policy in, in, in different areas. So I think that in order for uh, trade to be, you know, uh, to, to have a better free flow across the region, we need to, you know, have uh, better policy and to have similar policy in, in, in the different regions and, and just pick the, the best that, that there is in, in the different countries and, and hopefully uh, work together to, to make an effort on, on having that, to having a better uh, trade within the region. Carlos, you want to comment on that? Yes, um, I was mentioning before we were living in a short, in a smaller world every time, and there are many types of uh, economic interaction between between economies. No? One can be financial, other can be pure trade of products, other can be can be capital investment. So, I think it will depend uh, on what is uh, the opportunity or, or the strategic synergy that that it might come from that. What I think is that uh, we have, as, as Professor Siglitz was mentioning, some things that can allow us to, to view that there are many opportunities regarding investment, co uh, more in, uh, economic uh, interchange. One is 
the interest rates that are low, and they are low long term, that's something that we haven't seen in many years. And even though they can, be right, they, they can go up, they will still be low. The other part is that uh, there is a lot of money in the financial markets worldwide, pension funds, uh, different type of investment funds, looking for potential investments uh, within the, the, the economies. The other is that uh, for particularly for the con economies, strong economies such as US or Europe, the cost of energy coming down at least give us a view that uh, we can be optimistic on the long term, mid and long term growth of those economies. So that can generate an economic eh, engranaje, no sé cómo se diga, but an economic eh, co component no, that for the countries can eh, give something very important that is key in this new area. One is that the things that used to be lax in our countries that didn't allow us to, allow us to develop, today they can be opportunities, mm -hmm. particularly examples like infrastructure. Good infrastructure programs can find a way to get finance. They can be a strong generators of employment and economy within the, the, the society. And there are, uh, going, be, being more concrete, I think there are many opportunities that can be addressed, and it will depend on how the countries target that, that, those uh, opportunities regarding their strategic importance or the strategic complementation they can have in this, in this new, new ecosystem. Joe, cheap oil once upon a time would have been an obvious win for the U.S. Will it hinder the development of non-traditional form, form of energy? Should we be worrying about that? Uh, yes, I mean, you, you should be worried about it because uh, I think the uh, uh, incentives to, to try to develop renewable energy, um, which will, you know, America is still the largest uh, contributor per capita to global warming. I mean, we're, we're, we've been surpassed by China in total, but on a per capita basis, we're multiple times that of uh, any other country. I wanted to go back, if I can, to, to the question that was posed about, about uh, equality of opportunity, upward mobility. Uh, what he was referring to is a, a really striking fact about the United States that among the advanced countries, it is among the countries with the least equality of opportunity. And that's very different from the way Americans see ourselves and the way most other countries see us. What that means is the life prospects of a young American are more dependent on the income and education of his parents than in almost any of the other uh, advanced countries. Uh, this is uh, a natural result, in a sense, of uh, a systematic pattern. Countries with a high level of income and wealth inequality tend to have low levels of equality of opportunity. And so as America's inequality has gone up, uh, inequality of income, equality of opportunity has gone down. There are some checks against this, but unfortunately we aren't doing the, the right thing. Two mess messages uh, that come out of this. One of them is you should worry about the degree of equality of income, and that's where the advances in in Latin America over the last 15 years have been very important, and it's going to be very important as growth slows down that you keep up the pressure on, on that issue. The second thing is good public education has been, in the past, the most important check against this. You know, one of the reasons for the lack of equality of opportunity is, you know, in effect, there's an intergenerational transmission of advantage, and when you have a private school system, Children of wealthy parents get to go send their children to very good private schools. But in America, we also have a local public education system. The United States has more economic segregation today than we used to have. That means rich people live with rich pe uh, uh, together and poor people live poor, uh, with poor people. You have schools in the rich districts that are very good because it's all locally financed or mostly locally financed. And so the divide in educational opportunities has increased and is getting worse. And so the message that I take out of that is a lot of discussion about education in Latin America, a lot of advances that have been done, but, and there's a, 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 a concern about e 
quality of education is shown, for instance, about the deficiencies in the PISA scores. But it's going to be really important, I think, to make sure that there's more equal access to high quality education for everybody. Uh, if you don't do that, you're going to wind up like the United States, where, where you, everybody talks about equality of opportunity, but we all know it's a myth. So message for Latin Americans, don't copy the system in the US of <laughs> financing education with local taxes, both unfair and inefficient. One thing to take off the list, uh, the woman in the second row, please. Sorry, I don't know your name. And if we can get a microphone to her, that would be great. Hello, my name is Raya Mana. I am the founding curator of the Global Shapers Hub in Barranquilla, Colombia. And as one of the 50 shapers who are here representing the, boy, uh, the voice of youth in the region, my question is exactly that, according to your perspective, what is the, the role that youth are playing in the transformation of the region? Who wants to take that one up? Should I make just a couple comments from an outsider? <laughs> and, and then let, I, mean, I, I feel a little bit uh, nervous saying it's as an outsider, but I think there, there are two things. Uh, one of them is... Joe, I've seen you on panels for many years. I've never seen you be nervous. I'm sure you can <laughs> handle this. <laughs> uh, one, I think uh, there's... Uh, gives me a lot of optimism because the, the, the enthusiasm... You know, I'm glad there's so many uh, young shapers like you here. The enthusiasm and the consciousness about these issues, the issues of environment, gender equality, mm -hmm. Um, uh, uh, it, you know, all the, all the issues that you brought to the table are really rising to the national agenda, partly because the young people are, are stressing it. Uh, so I think, I think that's the optimistic, uh, the optimistic side. But from uh, the other side, from the economic point of view, I think there's going to be a very big challenge going forward, making sure, that, A, we provide the education, and then finally, uh, the jobs. Uh, in a lot of other countries, uh, in Europe right now, job opportunities for young people are, are not there. And so that's one of the reasons why it's going to be really important to maintain the macroeconomy at, at a pace of high job creation in order that, to keep the kind of enthusiasm that you have. Can I, can I mention something on, on, on that regard as well? Angelica. Um, it, it's not so much so on the economy side, but I think that you know, the young generations are the ones that are really going to shape, you know, the future, especially on, on the subject that really interests me. I have run into, you know, your generation, and you're looking for a place in life, not just to do more, like my generation, Eduardo's generation, maybe not Carlos's, but to also be more. <laughs> but, you know, but to also be more, and that is so important, you know, the kind of projects that you have that I've seen are really projects that are not just good for the economy, but they're good socially as well. And I think it's up to us to support and to really help you along in moving into that direction, you know? And, and you will be shaping what, for many, many years, we've been striving for. Men, your generation, most of, at least the ones that I've talked to, don't wanna be weekend parents. They wanna share, you know, the education of their children. So I think you're, 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 you're the ones that are going to transit into a more um, equal society if, if you really get together and understand that you know, it takes of both to make a, a more just and, and, uh, society. Let's take another question. First hand up was somebody in a red shirt, about five um, <laughs> rows or six rows uh, back there. Yes. Lisa Yen from Mexico from in the consulting firm Sight Law and Economics. I would like to ask uh, Professor Stieglitz regarding a more general question. I would like to move to, to question not of the TPP, but in more general the, the free trade agreement. I think they're a complement, a policy only, and they're not the panacea. There are many other policies that have to be put into place in order to see the benefits and to democratize the benefits of free trade agreements. But regarding to the investor state mechanism that you questioned, and I would like to contradict your view in, that, in this sense. 
particularly to the, uh, taking into consideration the Latin American reality in which there's a, a problem with the, with the rule of law and with corruption and with credibility of our judicial systems. And I do believe that the investor state mechanism does provide to investors the protection they need in our countries. And there is a problem, of course, in the way it has been applied, and we could narrow the possibilities of companies to demand the states in certain cases, like <coughs> the ones you mentioned that are very ridiculous. But this is a question of limiting the possibility of, um, of demanding the state in those cases, and also creating more responsibility and obligations to the investors under these mechanisms, which also should be revisited, but not eliminating or not questioning an agreement because it has a chapter on investor state. So we have an advocate for investment agreements. <laughs> okay, yep, wanna take that up, Joe? Yeah, uh, I'll try to be brief. Uh, <laughs> I think the, uh, the point I wanted to make first was that there is no evidence that these investment agreements lead to more investment. Uh, and more trade. Uh, that's been studied extensively, and, and therefore the notion that they will result in better outcomes is just, there's no evidence for it. There is evidence that they lead to the kind of problems that we saw in, or if we've seen in Uruguay. Just to, you know, uh, uh, I hope Latin America can negotiate a better agreement. Uh, there was a lot of pressure on the USTR just to carve out the cigarette issue. So they wouldn't be berated by me and say, we've already taken care of that. They refused. And this was in, you know, a lot of American NGOs were on this issue, health, every, you know, and they refused. So I hope Latin America is successful, but I am not optimistic. But a couple more points. Uh, Brazil, I think, has signed for the first time a couple agreements mm -hmm. where uh, they have investment agreements but they have not had this investor state dispute resolution mechanism. What they've said is, let's try to prevent, let's try to create an environment where we don't have these kinds of disputes. Let's try to create an investment climate where we don't wind up in court and we prevent the problem. And that's what they've done. They've, they signed agreements with Mozambique and with Angola. And, and, and what they've shown is they don't need this provision inside an agreement. And India, um, uh, South Africa, uh, and I say, and Brazil have said, no way are they going to touch any agreement with these kinds of provisions. Mm -hmm. Finally, uh, there are, at the very least, there ought to be a change so that civil society, uh, worker groups, labor unions also have access, equal access but it's only corporations that can get that can sue. So, for instance, if there's part of an agreement that says you're supposed to do certain things uh, and they don't fulfill that, civil society, labor groups, any other, the only people that can have access to these dispute resolution are the corporations. It's an, you know, no other legal framework says you are entitled and no one else can. So, uh, let me say, we've talked a lot, in the United States, we had a, a very big discussion of these agreements. Uh, in the beginning of the Obama administration, he set up a commission to look at them. Mm -hmm. And the USDR and the business community refused to move in response to very strong views from labor, from civil society, and unfortunately, the Obama administration in the new agreements has said, we're not going to use a compromise. They refused, and we're gonna go with what the corporations, the big corporations wanted. So that's why I'm not very, you know, even he's this his own domestic constituency, people who got him elected on this particular issue. Campaign contributions do make a difference. So we have a lawyer in our midst here, and I just wanna redirect this question to a lot of them the following way. Uh, the question said, look, we have lousy legal systems. Maybe that's true, maybe that's not. Depends on the country and the circumstance. So we should use a, a non-local legal system to arbitrate disputes. 
I can imagine two positions on this. One that says, well, if it's bad, we need to supplement it overseas. That's a great thing. But I could also imagine somebody saying, well, if we have something overseas for a subset of people, namely investors, we will never develop a good legal system at home to address everybody's needs and everybody's rights. As a lawyer, how do you think about that? 40 years as a lawyer taught me that paper is worthless when the parties don't want to reach an agreement. And whether you use arbitration, whether you use a WTO or any other mechanisms, it's a matter of setting the right rules and the right uh, values and principles and objectives at the very beginning. If there is uh, the wrong motivation at the very start, it's always going to be a win-lose or lose-lose. We may have time for one more question. Uh, second row front here. Or maybe more if the host will allow us. Good afternoon. My name is Johannes Karsten. I'm a global shaper from Cordoba Staff in Argentina. And I've heard a lot about the, the loss of trust in leadership within this day. And it were one of the most like interesting discussion. And I want to ask if, if you don't think that um, the attitude of some, and I want to remark some leaders, to deny society in its role as one of the principal stakeholders of their institutions, having contributed to this loss, and how do you think it can be, I don't know, fixed for the future? So, the tension between civil society and traditional political leadership, who wants to take a crack at that? Happy to start. Yeah, sure. yeah, I raised the issue of trust. Uh, and by the way, I'm Uruguayan, but I don't smoke, so uh, uh -huh. that's <laughs> just uh, to make sure. Uh, the issue of trust and leadership is getting uh, worse. Uh, and it's not uh, in politics or in, in party politics or it's not in in government, uh, the media has also lost uh, trust according to some uh, barometers that are very uh, publicized. The issue to me is uh, integrity and civil society can do a lot. It can be more demanding, it can help to set rules uh, of transparency. It can uh, help uh, through NGOs to use uh, digital media, uh, social media and uh, digital tools. Uh, there are even, I heard this morning in India, there's a, a website called uh, ipaidabribe.com. Uh, <laughs> and that, that has to have an impact. But the key to me is the youth uh, and uh, working, thinking in the long term. We need to change the mindset. We will have room for one more question. Um, and I'm just going to apply the principle of whoever has had his or her hand up for longer. We'll go for the far. Um, over there, yes, you have the last word. <laughs> if you can get a microphone. Hi, I am Gabriel Alfonso from Caracas, Venezuela. I'm a global shaper. And um, as you said, youth is the hope. But particularly for me, you guys are the hope because you have more weight in terms of decision making. So in order to have the change that we're willing everybody to have and to find, sacrifices has to be done. And it needs to, quítate tú un poquito, give me some space now, mm -hmm. to ourselves, to all the youth, and so especially, particularly you guys. In which way are you willing to step, step behind <laughs> and let us come <laughs> Thank you. For a moment there, when you said, quítate tú, I thought you were going to refer that to President Maduro, and I was eager to applaud. Um, <laughs> I'm glad to see I was not the only one. Well, we have a youthful member of our group, uh, <laughs> Angelica, uh, it's clear. So the youthful member of our group is going to address that. <laughs> At least you give me some expectancy that I can still be <laughs> doing my job for quite a while. I, I think that the, uh, what is very important here is uh, 
to get in, uh, in, either in companies, in governments, in, in social organizations, a good institutionalized process that is based in having the strategy of the entity to be reaching the goals uh, it requires and to be preparing the replacements it, it requires. As well as I has been mentioned uh, for, for, for quite some, some uh, of the answers, the, the importance of collaboration. And in collaboration, uh, well, some of the things that are happening in the paradigms, particularly with companies, is that nobody can do everything. No? So you may have a, a relationship with a company where you are competitor, partner, uh, provider, customer, and alliance at the same time. And that is what this society requires, that everybody does its job uh, addressing, and sorry if I, I sideline a little bit, but there are going to be, we are going to see more opportunities happening. Following what Professor Stiglitz was saying on education, I tend to disagree because I think uh, the digital education will, will equalize, uh, give a better equalizer for, for content and for access to uh, teachers' guidance and become a very strong, and it's already happening, complementary uh, uh, process within education in a massive scale, even in the more marginal communities, where we will reach that any people that, can, that is connected will be able to reach the same content and guidance that uh, any other people around the, the world. So I think it's, it's a process where more than stepping aside is a know how to collaborate, how to give space to the more capable people. And it's uh, an issue more than of age, it's an issue of capacity, commitment, and, uh, and hard work to, to achieve it. And uh, I'm sure that the space for, for all of you uh, will be open, but uh, I agree totally with you. We are, mm -hmm. we always say that the young people is the future, but the reality is what we uh, leaders in different areas are doing right now, and we need to address it, we need to, to work for it, and we, to, we need particularly to do it right. Thank you. Thank you very much. May I make one comment? Just, just I am getting looks that says we should end it, but just, we will give Angelica... A very, very quick comment on what you said. You know, one of the things that, that I mentioned is that we are here to be behind, you know, the, uh, or to be the force mm -hmm. to push you along in the projects that you have. I don't think it should be quitate de aquí so I can take over. I think it should be put yourself in that spot, and you, we have to have the willingness to support you and what you guys, you know, want to do, because at the end of the day, the world is for you, you know, you need to create your future. So I think it's, you know, like Carlos said, it, it takes of everybody collaborating and the willingness of the ones that can make things happen, you know, do that for you. Open that space. So let's uh, begin to bring this wonderful session to a close. Um, at some point, I'd be asked to summarize what was said, and I'm not going to attempt that crazy task. I could not possibly pull it off. Let me just underline two things that I've heard here. There's some things that we seem to know, or at least that we seem to agree on. For instance, the idea that job creation is good on many grounds, on grounds of equity, on, on grounds of growth, of dynamism, of social inclusion. Those are things that we can work on. There are other things that we don't necessarily agree on, but more importantly, there are some things that we don't necessarily claim to have the final answer on. Um, and uh, the people up here, even the very youthful ones, may not know all the answers, but I'm sure that the younger people in the room will come up with those answers very soon. And in that spirit, please join me in a big applause for everybody here. Now we uh, are going formally to put an end to this, and let me invite Marisol, our Mexican host, so that uh, they will, first of all, ring a bell or whatever it is one does, and secondly, tell us about where we meet next year. Thank you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, the Swiss host became Latin for a few minutes today, but that was great, and it was all worth it. And thank you for the Global Shapers to igniting such uh, great conversation here with the great answers that you made. Thank you for joining us. I also thank our wonderful co-chairs. Each one of you have been 
very inspiring in all the work that we have done, but this is only the beginning. We look forward to working with you towards the whole cycle of the year to make things happen. So thank you very much. I also thank the forum staff. This is teamwork, and this is the proof of great teamwork. And I can only thank another great member of our team, which has been ProMexico. When, this, when we decided to undertake this challenge, we decided we would be working as one team, not as counterparts. And the results that you have seen is a result of that. So thank you very much. Thank you, Mexico. Thank you, Francisco. I'll leave you with the floor. Thank you very much. So you remember you're in Mexico. I'll speak in Spanish. Muy buenas tardes. Bienvenidos a todos. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to all the global shakers. Welcome all of the academicians. Welcome everyone. It is a true privilege to be able to share this message with you. On the behalf of President Enrique Peña Nieto, who sends you his warmest greetings. He is with President Santos in Mexico City at this time. He hopes that your time here in Mexico has been very fruitful. As you know, the World Economic Forum for Latin America is one of the most relevant fora in the region. And it focuses on strategies and global trends, focusing on economic paradigms as we have been hearing just now. This was an excellent opportunity for the private and public sectors to come together. And we want to give a warm round of applause to the young entrepreneurs here. Obviously, we are trying to encourage a debate about strategic issues for development. In 2015, we had very encouraging results. Let me share some of those with you. About 1,000 people have attended this conference. That is a record for the event in Latin America in number and in quality, I would add. We had more than 45 countries represented. This is also historic high. We had heads of state from Haiti, Panama, and Mexico, 48 countries, 35 public sessions, 45 private, 223 bilateral meetings, and 28 ministers from 14 countries. We also reached some significant benchmarks. We had the 10th version of the World Economic Forum on Latin America, and this is the first time that Cuba participated in the Latin American World Economic Forum. Here we were focusing on prosperity for the Northern Triangle to encourage energy um, connections. And the conferences and panel discussions that have been held have given us many lessons learned. And we have been able to move forward in a systematic fashion as we focus on renovation. We are at a time when we must focus on structural reform in order to encourage growth in Latin America, the Caribbean, and of course Mexico. And here at the Maya, Riviera Maya, we focused on issues important for the world. We focused on how we can improve productivity and competitiveness, not only in Mexico, but in the region. This innovation or this renovation agenda is broad and it bodes well for a promising future when it comes to productivity, infrastructure, the environment, and more. Focusing on education, innovation, and also responsibility. Without a doubt, we are going to strengthen the links between us and we will build an agenda for renovation that will allow us to achieve our global objectives. As President Peña Nieto shared with us, we have ahead of us a great challenge, and we have a number of activities to be carried out. It was an honor for us to show Mexico, a country in transition, and to be the standard bearer of the World Economic Forum. 
I would also like to thank the government of Quintana Roo for their contribution to the success of this forum. But my greatest thanks is to the World Economic Forum for choosing us for the third time as the host country for this important event. President Peña Nieto has seen the importance of this forum for Latin America, and it has offered us the opportunity to build a more prosperous future. Let us focus on development, and let us all work to be better. I also would like to invite you to the lunch that the Secretary of Tourism is offering where we had our dinner before. I want to thank all of you for joining us at the World Economic Forum on Latin America. I wish you safe travels home, and I hope that you will join us again in Mexico. We will always receive you with open arms and an open heart.